In the 16th chapter of Mark's gospel, Jesus gave the commission to his disciples to go into all the world and to do as he commanded, verse 15. This commission is still in effect. Here it is. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they, the sick, shall recover. That's in verse 18. Just before he said this, Jesus had said, These signs shall follow them that believe, and added, In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. In other words, they shall get well after the believer has laid hands on them. Any believer can lay hands on the sick, and the promise is they shall recover. A believer is more than one who merely agrees that the word is true. A believer always acts on the word of God. God never tells us to do something that we can't do. Obtaining the fulfillment of his promise is more a matter of obedience than of faith. By doing what God tells us to do, then expecting God to do what he tells us he will do, that is faith. Noah built the ark. God flooded the earth. Moses stretched out the rod. God parted the waters. Joshua marched around the Jericho walls, but God tore them down. Elijah smote the waters, but God parted them. Elisha threw the stick in the river, but God made the iron swim. Naaman dipped seven times, but God healed his leprosy. Jesus said, it's the believer who should lay hands on the sick, but it's God who will cause him to recover. James said that the elders should anoint any sick with oil and pray over them the prayer of faith. Then he says, it's the Lord who will raise up the sick. God says, you do the small thing, I'll do the large thing. You do a foolish thing, I'll do a wise thing. You do something that only a person can do. I'll do something that only I, God, can do. Do what God tells you to do. Then expect God to do what he said he would do. That is faith. When Jesus visited our house. When we were very young, Daisy and I went to India as missionaries. But we couldn't convince the Hindus and Muslims that Jesus Christ is God's son and that he's raised from the dead. They asked us to prove it. I read verses from our Bible to them, but they had their Quran. They claimed that was God's word given by the mouth of his holy prophet Muhammad. Both books, the Bible and the Quran, were beautiful black books with gold letters on their covers, which was God's word. We couldn't prove that it was the Bible because we didn't understand faith and miracles at that time. So we returned to America in what seemed to us to be shame and defeat. But we had seen the masses, and we knew they needed to believe the good news of Jesus Christ in order to be saved. We fasted and prayed many days for God to show us his answer to help non-Christians to believe on Jesus Christ, to be convinced that he's more than just another religion. God answered our prayers. One morning at 6 a.m., Jesus Christ awakened me in our bedroom. I lay before him as though I was dead, unable to move a finger or a toe. Water poured from my eyes, yet I was not conscious of weeping. After a long while, I was able to crawl from my bed to the floor where I lay on my face until the afternoon. When I walked out of that room, I was a new man. Jesus became Lord and master of my life. I knew this truth. He's alive. He's more than a religion. Soon after that awesome experience, a wonderful man of God came to our area. He had an amazing gift of healing. As we attended his meetings, we saw hundreds accept Christ. And right before our eyes, we watched him cast out devils and lay hands on the sick in Jesus Christ's name. The blind, the deaf, the dumb, the cripples were healed instantly. 
a thousand voices whirled over my head saying, You can do that. That's what Peter and Paul did. That's what Jesus did. That proves that the Bible is good today. You can do that. As we walked out of that packed auditorium, I was overwhelmed. We began fasting and praying again. Daisy and I made a new pact with God. We resolved that we would read the New Testament as though we had never read it before in our lives, and we would believe everything we read. Whatever Jesus told us as his followers to do, we would do. Whatever he said he would do, we would expect him to do it. We would act upon his written words just as prophets of God acted upon his spoken word in Bible days. We would do as the disciples of our Lord had done. If he said we could heal the sick, we would expect to see the sick healed. If he said we could cast out devils, then we would do it in his name and expect them to obey us. I can never tell you what that step meant to us. The Bible became a living, pulsating, thrilling book of truth. We disregarded all of the teachings we had ever had. We accepted God's word as being literally true and began to act on it exactly like the early Christian believers did. Through that decision, we discovered the authority we have in the name of Jesus and the power we have over the kingdom of Satan as well as the virtue that flows through every real believer. As this living audio edition of this book is being produced for you, I can witness that for over three decades, in nearly 70 nations of the world, Daisy and I have gone in Jesus' name and have acted on the written word of God. We've preached to multitudes, from 20,000 to over 200,000 souls daily in these mass crusades, and have seen literally tens of thousands of the most amazing miracles perhaps ever witnessed in any Christian ministry. God's word becomes very simple when we regard every word as true and act accordingly. It loses all of its supposed complications. Its staggering truths of power and authority granted to the church become a living reality. Often I have said since then how thrilling it is to preach a gospel that works. As we constantly witness the deliverance of the deaf and dumb, the restoring of sight to the blind, the healing of the lame, the crippled, the sick and diseased, we rejoice over the truth of Jesus' words all things are possible to him that believeth. In Mark 9, 23. They shall lay hands on the sick. Everywhere believers lay their hands on the sick in faith, the sick recover. We should expect nothing less than this. Mark chapter 5, verses 23 to 41 records the incident of faith in laying on of hands when Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, said to Jesus, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, and she shall live. The Bible says, Jesus went and took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Arise, and she arose. In Luke chapter 13, verses 11 to 13, Jesus saw a woman bowed over with a spirit of infirmity, and he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. In Acts 28, verse 8, the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. If you are a believer, the nature of God is in you. The Spirit of God dwells in you as his temple. The power of God is in you, and it's this power of God that heals the sick when the hands are laid on them in Jesus' name. Sometimes this is accompanied by manifestations. You may feel the life of God pouring through your body, making it whole. At other times, you may feel nothing. 
It makes no difference whether or not you have a feeling. The word of God is superior to your feelings. It's written, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That word is always true. Whether feeling comes or not, healing always comes. A lady came to us for prayer, and after the meeting, she was asked how she felt. Well, I never got blessed, she replied, but I got healed. A few moments later, as she was musing over her wonderful healing, she became happy and got blessed. Many people such as this lady expect a feeling when prayed for instead of expecting healing. One may be healed by the power of God and never feel anything. Others may feel great surges of God's healing power, a heat, a coolness, or a shock as of a current of electricity. But take my advice. Don't expect feeling. Expect healing. A minister said to me, I used to pray for God to slay people under his power and cause them to fall when I prayed for him. And he did just what I asked him to do. Most everyone I laid my hands on fell. But then he said, I discovered that many of them would arise to find that they were not healed. I then began to pray for God to heal them instead of slay them. He said he found that God was faithful to do what he asked him to do. Now, whether they fall or not, he said, I expect them to get healed. And it's done according to our faith. This was a man who had wanted feeling instead of healing. He came to realize this, and now his ministry is far greater. Healing is always better than feeling. When the sick learn to base their faith on the word of God exclusively, they have absolutely won the victory. It then becomes true that nothing in the realm of feeling can ever separate them from thus saith the word of God. As long as you talk in terms of what you feel, you've not yet comprehended the meaning of faith in the word of God. Faith has nothing to do with anything but the word of God. Let us suppose that you come to us for prayer to be healed. After we prayed for you, you say, I believe I got healed. I feel so much better. Or, I can't feel a pain. You're talking in terms of what you feel. Sooner or later, if you get a bad feeling, you'll still talk in terms of what you feel. And you'll say, well, I thought I got healed, but I feel so bad, I guess I'll have to be prayed for again. You nullify your healing by believing in what you feel more than in God's word of promise. You'll notice that people who judge their healing by their feelings will never credit God's word. If they get healing, it's because they feel good. If they feel bad, they didn't get healing. They never give credit to what God says. I was taken to the room of a sick man. When I encouraged him to look to God for deliverance from his lifelong sickness, he replied, I feel like I'll be healed someday. I asked him why he felt that way. Well, he replied, several have received the witness that I'd be healed someday. Even the pastor thinks I'll get well. And I remember that a long time ago, the Lord blessed me and gave me a witness that I was going to be healed. He was struggling to believe for healing on the basis of someone's witness or feeling. You see, he never mentioned the word of God as having any promise for him, nor did God's witness and promise mean anything to him. Train yourself to believe God's word. Faith in the word wins. Faith is never feeling. Feeling is never faith. Faith has nothing to do with feeling. Feeling has nothing to do with faith. Faith constantly ascribes everything to thus saith the word of God, irrespective of pains, symptoms, or feelings. Suppose you come for prayer with faith in the word instead of faith in feelings. You're ministered to, according to the scriptures, by the laying on of hands, and perhaps are anointed with oil. Then someone asks, how do you feel? You answer, I am healed because the word says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. 
But the inquirer insists. Do you feel any better? Your answer is very positive, knowing that God's throne and his word are back of what you say. I know I'm healed because it's written, with his stripes we are healed. You may add, God said, I am the Lord that healeth thee, and that means me. The work has been done because you ascribed your healing to the power and authority and faithfulness of the word of God. You may ask, but what about my feelings? Must we continue to carry our pains? No, you need not carry your pains and aches with you, ignoring them as the Christian science practitioner would advise. Neither will you lie about your pains. If the pain is there, don't lie about it. Neither confess it. Always speak the truth. But here's the secret. Answer the inquirer with the word of God. Say just exactly what the word says. By his stripes we are healed. They laid hands on me and I shall recover. Jesus said it and he cannot lie. Faith disregards everything but God's word. When the hands of believers are laid upon you, you will recover if you only believe it. Stand by the word of God and God will stand by you. 1 Kings 8.56 says, There hath not failed one word of all his good promise. Ezekiel 12.25 I am the Lord. I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. Ezekiel 12.28 The word that I have spoken shall be done, saith the Lord God. 2 Corinthians 1.20 for all the promises of God in him, Jesus Christ, are yea, and in him, Jesus Christ, amen, under the glory of God by us. When a Christian lays his hands on you in Jesus' name and earnestly prays for your healing, believe the word of God. Believe that Jesus spoke the truth when he said, they shall recover, feeling or no feeling. It's written, they shall recover. And in 2 Corinthians 1, 24, it's written, by faith ye stand. Faith in God's word always brings the answer. Thank him for healing from the very moment that the hands of believers are laid on you in Jesus' name. Message number nine. The use of blessed cloths. The people in Asia believed that by taking cloths, from Paul's body, sick people would be healed and evil spirits would depart from those possessed. Acts 19 verses 11 and 12 says, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out from them. God is no respecter of persons. This ministry of sending forth claws from the bodies of God's servants is still in effect today, and thousands of miracles are taking place through this simple ministry. When sick people receive these claws and lay them on their bodies in faith, as though the servant of God had laid his own hands on their bodies and had prayed, the same results follow today. When Paul sent these claws and aprons to the sick, it was because he could not go to them personally nor could they be brought to him. When the people took the claws from Paul's body to the sick, they laid them on their sick bodies with the same faith that they would have exercised if Paul had come personally and laid his hands on them and ministered to them. It's in such cases today that we send out claws over which we've prayed. If you're sick and will believe God's promise, and if you'll consider that when this cloth is laid on your body, it's as though we had come personally and prayed for you. And if you'll believe then that God has heard the prayer and granted his healing, you will be healed. We receive testimonies almost daily from those who have been healed through this simple act of faith. Message number 10. Healing in Redemption. Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5 says, Surely he has borne our griefs or sicknesses and diseases, and carried our sorrows or pains. 
but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. By these scriptures we know that healing for the body is in the same redemption as salvation for the spirit. In redemption there is both physical and spiritual healing. If we're saved, we should be healed. If we're healed, we should be saved. Our Lord could not be satisfied with a half salvation. When you realize that healing is part of your personal salvation, you need not call for the elders. You need not have hands laid on you. You no longer need to ask in Jesus' name for what you already possess. Neither do you need two to agree with you in prayer. You appropriate Christ's life for both body and spirit. You know that you are freed from the bondage of sickness as well as from sin. You see your substitute, Jesus Christ, made sick and sinful for you. You come to know that neither sin nor sickness can ever be laid to your charge again. Jesus bore them all on the cross for you. You comprehend the truth of Matthew 8, 17. Himself took our infirmities or our weaknesses and bare our sicknesses or our diseases. You know that Jesus, your substitute, has delivered your body from sickness as well as your spirit from sin. You see your sicknesses as well as your sins laid on Jesus at Calvary. And you know that if Jesus bore your infirmities and your sicknesses, you no longer need to bear them. If you need to bear them, then it was useless for Jesus to bear them. But since he has borne them, and the word says that they were yours, then certainly you don't have to bear them. Christians do not need to be sick. God wants them well and strong. See your sins forgiven and your sicknesses healed. See deliverance for your body as well as for your spirit. Begin to sing with David, Bless the Lord, O my soul and forget not all his benefits. Many have forgotten some of the benefits of redemption. David hadn't. He said, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. That's in Psalms 103, verses 2 and 3. David shouts, Forgiveth all, and healeth all in the same breath. At last you've come to know why Jesus said, whether is it easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed and walk. At last, the joy unspeakable and full of glory, a full salvation has become real to you. You see a complete deliverance. You join with Peter in saying, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, by whose stripes ye were healed. You see it all done in redemption. You are a free person. No more sin, no more sickness. Both have been borne away by our substitute. It's when you come to know these vital truths that your sickness begins to melt away. Your deformed limbs begin to straighten. You find yourself free in body as well as free in spirit. You no longer take your place with Job of the Old Testament, thinking that you must suffer sickness because Job suffered. Never. You've learned that you are living on this side of Calvary, under grace and truth that sets you free from the curse of the law. A minister told me some time ago, every time I pray for the sick, either myself, my wife, or my child becomes ill. Then he went on to tell me that he believed he must have these tests to prove his faith, that it was his duty to prove himself faithful in sickness in order for God to use him in the healing of others who were sick. I asked him if he felt that he should prove himself faithful in sin 
in order for God to use him in preaching salvation to sinners. And then I told him, the difference between your preaching and mine is that you're preaching and believing that you must suffer and be faithful before you can tell others that they can be healed. I tell people that Jesus has already suffered for them and for me, that therefore we can all enjoy the redemption that he's provided for us, that Jesus is the substitute, not me. E.W. Kenyon says, Jesus bore our infirmities, our diseases, and our sicknesses, and what he bore we do not need to bear. What he took upon himself, we do not need to suffer. Satan cannot legally lay on us what God laid on Jesus. Mr. Kenyon continues, Christ became sick with our diseases that we might be healed. He knew no sickness until he became sick for us. The object of Christ's sin-bearing was to make righteous all those who would believe in him as their sin-bearer. And the object of his disease bearing was to make well all those who would believe on him as their disease bearer. Christ's sin bearing made righteousness sure to the new creation. He took our sins and so made us righteous. His disease bearing made healing sure to the new creation. He took our diseases and so made us well. He took our infirmities and so made us strong. And he now trades us success for our failures. Dr. E. W. Kenyon continues, disease makes slaves of the people who care for the sick. The loved ones who are up day and night working over the sick ones are robbed of joy and rest. Sickness is not of love and God is love. Sickness steals health. It steals happiness. It steals money that we need for other things. Disease is our enemy. It is a robber. Look at what it has stolen from that tuberculosis patient. It came upon him in young manhood and has made him a burden to his family, filled him with anxiety and doubts, fears and pains, and robbed him of his faith. Dr. Kenyon says, don't tell anyone that disease is the will of God. It is the will of hate. It is the will of Satan. If disease has become the will of love, then love is turned into hate. If disease is the will of God, then heaven will be filled with sickness. Mr. Kenyon says, Jesus was the express image of the Father, and he went about healing all the sick according to Acts 10, 38. And then he concludes, disease and sickness are never the will of the Father. To believe they are is to be deluded by the adversary. If healing had not been in the plan of redemption, then it would never have been placed in the great substitutionary chapter of Isaiah 53, end quote. This is the deliverance that we desire that you find as you listen to this living audio book. Act on it, and you'll discover new health returning to your body. Faith in God's Word is never ignored by the Father. Instead, it always brings His complete answer. This is the faith He longs to see you exercise. It will become a part of you. It will become as natural to your spiritual person as seeing and hearing is to your natural person. God said in Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord that healeth thee. If three million people could believe it and find perfect health and strength under the law, Cannot we, who are living under grace, mercy, and truth, be a healthy body of Christ? A man came to me asking that we pray for his healing. He had been stone deaf in one ear for over 20 years. He seemed to be very uncertain regarding his healing, because as he put it, I've been prayed for by the greatest people of faith in our country during the last 20 years, and I've never received help. Then he asked, why can't my ear be healed? It can, I replied, if you'll believe. But they've all told me that, he said, and I've never received help from any one of them. My friend, I interrupted, acting as though he were some unworthy character, do you think God is willing to heal a fellow like you? I don't know, he answered, and then added, I know that if it's his will to do it, he's sure able, but, well, I guess that's just one of those things that we're not supposed to know. I said, that's why you've never been healed. 
you've never read the word of God for yourself, nor have you received with faith what's been preached to you. You don't know whether or not God has said he would heal you. Therefore, it's no wonder that you don't know whether or not it's his will to heal you. Then I ask him, do you believe it's God's will to keep his promise? Of course, he replied. Well, I said, he has promised to heal you. And if I can quote you his promise, then you should believe him and be healed right here and now. I quoted a few scriptures regarding the healing of our bodies, which are applicable to everyone individually, such as, I am the Lord that healeth thee, spoken to over three million people. Or, by whose stripes ye were healed, 1 Peter 2.24. And, is any sick among you, let him call, James 5.14. Then I ask, now, in the face of all these scriptures, which are promises made to all who will believe them, do you think God included you? Yes, he said, I guess he did. Well, then I ask, is God willing to heal you, seeing that he's made provision for the healing of every sickness and every disease among all the people? Yes, he said very firmly. I do believe healing is for me tonight. I've never seen it like this before. There seemed to be a glitter of faith in his eyes when he saw that God's word was for him personally. I knew the circumstances were right for prayer on his behalf, and I had hardly touched his deaf ear before sound burst into it, and he could hear me as well with that ear as with the other. When at last he knew what God had said regarding all sickness and disability, and dared to step out on that word, declaring himself as included in the any of James 5.14, in the V of Exodus 15.26, in the hour of Matthew 8.17, then the word was accomplished on his behalf. That illustrates so well the purpose for which this audio book is prepared, that you may see that the promises in God's word are for you, and that realizing this, you will act upon God's word of promise and expect him to make it good in your life. What faith is? Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This verse is sometimes quoted, Faith is the title deed for things which you've hoped for, the putting to proof of things unseen. Or put another way, faith is the title deed to the property you know you possess, even though you've not seen it yet. One of the most helpful and enlightening expressions of faith is this. Faith is expecting God to do what you know he said in his word that he will do. Faith is believing that God did not lie. God has never asked that we exercise faith for something that he has not first promised to do for us. One writer said, God deals with his children thus. First, he gives us a promise, and when that promise creates faith which produces action, he fulfills it. Always remember, God never asks us to believe he will do something for us unless he first promises to do it. Because of this fact, Paul has stated in Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing the word of promise. How could faith possibly come any other way? How am I to know that a millionaire would make me a present of a thousand dollars unless he said that he would do it? His ability to do it would not prove his willingness to do it. I must have his promise before I can expect such a gift from him. The only way for your daughter to know that she will receive a new dress tomorrow is for you to promise it to her. She believes that you will not fail to keep your word. Yet there's a possibility that you could be killed before tomorrow or that you might have lied to her, but not so with the Lord. Balaam, a prophet of the Lord, said, in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Christ the Healer. Evangelist F.F. F. Bosworth, 
who has written one of the most outstanding books ever to be published on the subject of divine healing, opens his 250-page treasure, Christ the Healer, with these words. Before you can have a steadfast faith for the healing of your body, you must be rid of all uncertainty concerning God's will in the matter. Appropriating faith cannot go beyond your knowledge of the revealed will of God. Then he says, Before attempting to exercise faith for healing, you need to know what the scriptures plainly teach that is just as much God's will to heal the body as it is God's will to heal the spirit. It is only by knowing that God promises what you're seeking that all uncertainty can be removed and a steadfast faith can be made possible. And then Mr. Bosworth says, God's promises are each a revelation of what God is eager to do for us. Until we know what God's will is, there's nothing to base our faith on. Then he goes on to say, Jesus said, the word is the seed. It is the seed of divine life. If you need healing, until you are sure from God's word that it is his will to heal you, you are trying to reap a harvest where there's no seed planted. It would be impossible for a farmer to have faith for a harvest before he or she was sure that the seed had been planted. Mr. Bosworth says further, It's not God's will that there be a harvest without the planting of seed, without his will being known and acted upon. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Freedom from sickness comes from knowing the truth, and God does nothing without his word. He sent his word, and it healed them, are the words of the Holy Spirit in Psalms 107, verse 20. Fenton's translation says, All his work is done in faithfulness to his promises. F.F. F. Bosworth continues in his book, If you're sick, to know that it's God's will to heal you is the seed which is to be planted in your mind and heart. And it's not planted there until it's known and received and trusted. You cannot become a Christian until you know that it's God's will to save you. It's the word of God planted and watered and steadfastly trusted which heals both spirit and body. The seed must remain planted and be kept watered before it can produce its harvest. For you to say, I believe the Lord is able to heal me, before you know from God's word that he is willing to heal you, is like a farmer saying, I believe God is able to give me a harvest without any seed being planted and watered. God cannot regenerate your spirit before you know God's will in the matter, because salvation is by faith, that is, by trusting the known will of God. Being healed is being saved in a physical sense. Reverend Bosworth says, Praying for healing with the faith-destroying words, if it be thy will, is not planting the seed, it is destroying the seed. The prayer of faith which heals the sick is to follow, not precede the planting of the seed upon which alone faith is based. This is the gospel which the Holy Spirit says is the power of God unto salvation in all its phases, both physical and spiritual. And all the gospel is for every creature and for all nations. The gospel does not leave a man in uncertainty, praying with an, if it be thy will. It tells him what God's will is. The Holy Spirit's words, himself bear our sicknesses, are just as truly a part of the gospel as are his words, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Neither the spiritual nor the physical phase of the gospel is to be applied by prayer alone. Seed is powerless unless it's planted. Mr. Bosworth then makes this argument. He says, many, instead of saying, pray for me, should first say, teach me God's word so that I can intelligently cooperate for my recovery. We must know what the benefits of redemption are before we can appropriate them by faith. David specified, who forgiveth 
all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. After being sufficiently enlightened, our attitude toward sickness should be the same as our attitude toward sin. Our purpose to have our body healed should be as definite as our purpose to have our spirit healed. We should not ignore any part of the gospel. Our substitute bore both our sins and our sicknesses that we might be delivered from both. Christ's bearing of our sins and sicknesses is surely a valid reason for trusting him now for the deliverance of both. Mr. Bosworth continues, when in prayer we definitely commit to God the forgiveness of our sins, we're to believe on the authority of his word that our prayers heard. We're to do the same when praying for healing. Proverbs 4 verse 20 to 22 says, Attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. God says, Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. In this comprehensive passage, God tells us exactly how to attend to his words. He says, let them not depart from thine eyes. Instead of having your eyes on your symptoms and being occupied with them, let not God's word depart from thine eyes. That is, look at God's word continually. And like Abraham, wax strong in faith by looking at the promises of God and at nothing else. When we attend unto God's word by not letting them depart from our eyes and by keeping them in the midst of our hearts, the seed is in good ground, the kind of ground in which Jesus said, it bringeth forth fruit, and where Paul said, it effectually worketh. When the farmer gets his seed into the ground. He doesn't dig it up every day to see how it's doing, but he says, I'm glad that's settled. And he believes that the seed has begun its work. Why not have the same faith in the imperishable seed, Christ's words, which he says are spirit and life, and believe that they are already doing their work without waiting to see? Mr. Bosworth makes this argument then. When your eyes are upon your symptoms and your mind is occupied with them more than with God's word, you have in the ground the wrong kind of seed for the harvest that you desire. You have in the ground seeds of doubt. You're trying to raise one kind of crop from another kind of seed. It's impossible to sow tares and reap wheat. Your symptoms may point you to death, but God's word points you to life. And you cannot look in these opposite directions at the same time. After you've planted your seed, you believe it's growing before you see it grow. This is faith, which is the evidence of things not seen. In Christ, we have perfect evidence for faith. Evangelist Bosworth concludes, Any man or woman can get rid of their doubts by looking steadfastly and only at the evidence which God has given for our faith. Seeing only what God says will produce and increase faith. This will make it easier to believe than to doubt, for the evidences for faith are much stronger than those for doubting. Don't doubt your faith. Doubt your doubts, for they are unreliable. End of quote. He is able if he will. A lady said to me, Mr. Osborne, I would give anything to have my mother healed. I know God's able to completely restore her, and I believe I have the faith that God would heal her if I only knew it was his will to do so. I asked her, Do you believe it's God's will to save a sinner? Oh, yes, she replied. How do you know, I asked. Well, she answered, if for no other reason, the golden text of the Bible, John 3.16, proves that. It says, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. She was willing to believe that God would save the vilest sinner because she could quote one Bible verse which promised what she believed. I asked her, don't you believe it's God's will to heal your mother? Well, I don't know that we can tell, was her reply. Will God keep his promise, I asked her. Yes, of course he will, she said. 
Well, I answered, the same Bible that invites whosoever to be healed of his sins also invites any to be healed of his sicknesses. Then I continued, the same Jesus who always forgave sins always healed sicknesses. It was the same deliverer who said, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, in Mark 2 and 9, who said, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee, in Matthew 9 and 2. I continued, The same scripture that says, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, also says, Who healeth all thy diseases, Psalms 103 verse 3. The same scripture that says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body, also says, by whose stripes ye were healed. 1 Peter 2.24 Christ came to rid us of sickness as well as sin. He took our sicknesses as well as our sins. He redeemed us from the one, the same as from the other. I told the woman, both sin and sickness are hateful in God's sight. Jesus Christ always defeated both while here on earth, and he still wants to do the same. If you can be so sure that God is willing to save the sinner, then you can be just as sure that he's willing to heal your mother who is sick. The woman was amazed and thrilled beyond measure at the simplicity of the word of God and was very happy to discover that Christ is the healer for all just like he's the Savior for all. Faith is only believing that God will do what he said in his word of promise that he would do. This fact places that mysterious something that people call faith within the reach of the simplest child. When once we conclude that the written word is God's revealed will to us for everything that he longs to do for us, then we will treasure that word and stand upon it, fully expecting God to make it good without wavering, doubting, or worrying. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Healing from Heaven Lillian B. Yeomans, M.D., begins chapter 2 of her wonderful book, Healing from Heaven, with these words. I believe that one of the greatest hindrances to healing is the absence of certain definite knowledge as to God's will. There is lurking in almost everyone who has not properly studied God's word a feeling that God may not be willing that we have to persuade him to heal us. People often say, I know that God is able. He has the power to heal me if he only will. Like the leper in the 8th chapter of Matthew who said to Jesus, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Dr. Yeoman says, Many of us have been taught to pray, If it be thy will, heal me. That wasn't the way David prayed. He cried in Psalm 6, 2, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. Then adds in the ninth verse, The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Dr. Yeomans continues, There are no ifs or buts in David's prayer. And the prophet Jeremiah, too, had no doubt about God's will as to healing. For he cried in Jeremiah 17, 14, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. And we, God's people of this day, should be as free from doubt regarding God's will for our bodies as they were. For it is as clearly revealed in the word as is his will concerning our spiritual salvation. Dr. Yeoman then says this, In a sense, the whole Bible is a revelation, not only of God's willingness to heal our spiritual ailments, but our physical ones also. One of his covenant names is the Lord that healeth. Jehovah Rapha. And he is also the Lord that changeth not, the changeless 
healing, health-bestowing, life-giving Lord, undisputed sovereign over all the powers of the universe. And then the doctor concludes, Jesus is the express image of the Father, the perfect expression of God and his holy will. He could say, he that hath seen me hath seen my Father also. And he declared that his works were not his own, but the Father's that sent him. And he healed all who came to him, never refusing a single individual. You cannot find a case where he said, it is not my will to heal you, or it is necessary for you to suffer for disciplinary purposes. His answer was always, I will. And that fact forever settles for us God's will in regard to sickness. End of quote. Salvation includes physical healing. The word salvation, if properly understood, shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that healing for the body is always the will of God for any and all who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Webster tells us that the meaning of the word salvation is deliverance from sin and sin's penalty. A prominent part of that penalty is sickness, according to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 to 61. The word saved, as used in Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 21, and Romans 10 and 9, and many other places in the Bible, is the Greek word sozo, which, when properly translated, carries the meaning of physical and spiritual healing. It is the same word Jesus used when he said to the leper, Thy faith hath made thee whole, Luke 17, 19. And it's the same word used in Luke 8, 36. He that was possessed of the devils was healed. The word salvation is an all-inclusive word which gathers into itself the meaning of full deliverance, complete safety, preservation, and soundness, spiritually, mentally, and physically. What a miracle! Salvation from sin and from sickness. Salvation is healing. Dr. John G. Lake, a great missionary evangelist in South Africa at the turn of the 20th century, had a ministry which resulted in the healing of thousands. In an article entitled, The Dominion of a Christian, under the subhead of divine healing, not something separate from salvation, he writes these words. One of the difficulties on the line of healing that God has to remove from our human mind is this wretched thing that often prevails in the best of Christian circles where healing is taught and practiced. The idea that divine healing is something disassociated or separate from Christ's salvation. It is not. Healing is simply the salvation of Jesus Christ having its divine action in a person's body, the same as it had its divine action in one's spirit. When Christ healed the body, he healed the spirit also. All one needs to do is let God come in. Doing this, one's defective eyes receive sight, the dormant mind becomes active, and the sick body is healed. Dr. Lake goes on to say, I want to fix this thought in your minds. The healing of an individual is God's demonstration to that soul that his sins have been forgiven. And so James states, after affirming that the prayer of faith shall save the sick, that if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. If only the victim of sin and sickness who's come to Jesus for deliverance will have faith enough to believe it, he or she will go forth from the presence of God, free in body, free in spirit, healed within and healed without. The Word of God, Dr. Lake says, is calculated to give an intelligent idea as to what the will of God is. From Genesis to the Revelation, it especially emphasizes one thing, that the will of God is to extricate the body, the mind, and the spirit from sin and the effects or penalty of sin, which are disease and death. When the will of God is fully wrought in the race, sin, sickness, and death will have disappeared. The beginning of immortality 
is when God breathes his life into you and me and our spirits become the recipients of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Dr. Lake says this, how simple it should be for people who have this confidence and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation to add faith for the body as well as for the spirit. It works identically the same for sickness as for sin. And furthermore, had this truth been preached, your sickness question would have vanished once and for all when your sin question was taken care of. And he concludes with this, one of the most enjoyable freedoms in the world is the mental and spiritual freedom that comes with escape from the bondage of fear. The fear of sickness need never be tolerated by the redeemed, recreated, and delivered child of Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, the great physician, our healer. End of quote. Impossible to have faith without knowing God's definite will. It might be thought that this truth has been somewhat overemphasized, but if you could stand by our sides as we proclaim these truths and hear the warnings... Beware of false prophets who will deceive you with miracles, or it may not be the Father's will to heal you, or sickness is often his divine blessing, or healing is not for today, and so forth. Then you would understand why we underscore the fact that according to God's word, it is always his will to heal those who will obey him, believe him, and act boldly on his word of promise.